Okay. Um, yeah. So, hi everyone. Uh, obviously, you can see from the sides, uh, I'm Sam. Um, yeah, today I'm just going to um, try and talk through uh, chapter 10 uh, on function factories. Um, and hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully I can um, explain this well and uh, help you understand uh, help you understand the chapter. Oh, sorry, I've got to do arrows. Um, yeah, so see, simple question to start with. Um, what are function factories? Um, so yeah, function factories are functions that produce functions. Um, so uh, uh, in this thing here, um, I've got on the slide, um, power one um, is the function factory. And you know, as factories normally do, um, they manufacture functions. So here, um, square and cube um, are manufacture, manufacture functions that have been produced by this uh, power one. Um, so, yeah, so um, to the power to um, the function factory, um, you provide a value for exponent. Um, and um, then when you call um, the function square or cube, um, your value as a square or cube um, will be, um, you know, um, will be, you know, for example, in square, it's two to the power, um, two to the power of two. Um, so I think for me, at least, um, to try and understand how these are working, I think, um, I think you need just to have a quick reminder, or at least I did on, I guess, some key concepts about how functions work. Uh, and I think that helps sort of understand how, you know, function factories are actually working. Um, so obviously key point number one is that every time you call a function, um, a new environment is created and the function, you know, is executed inside this environment. Um, you know, this is typically referred to as the execution environment. Um, but when a function, you know, is also created, it also binds or captures the environment in which the function was uh, defined. Um, and this is typically, you know, coins the enclosing environment. So this example, power one, we had here. Um, power one, uh, so when, when you call power one and you give a value for exponent, it creates an execution value every uh, execution environment every time it is run. Um, and so when function, you know, when you run this function and this is created, um, it binds the environment enclosing it. Um, so for function X, um, this is the execution environment um, of power one. Uh, so this means, oh, sorry. Yeah. So, you know, this, this is sort of how, um, cause at high level, how, um, square and cube, um, you know, are able to, uh, able to track, um, the value of exponent, um, and how, you know, this value, um, you know, how this value is able to be different, um, for square and cube and, uh, each time you call power one. Um, so as, you know, as, as, uh, in the chapter, um, you know, one of the ways he tries to work through this, um, is to try and look at, um, you know, printing the environments that, um, that square and cube have. Um, and so, you know, initially, if you just, you know, if you just call, if you just, uh, call the funny brackets or any arguments, it just prints the function body. Um, so, you know, this isn't too helpful to try and, um, you know, understand, uh, which value um, or the value that exponent is bound to in each case, um, but it does at least show you that um, that these functions are their own unique environment. Um, so, to be able to um, you know to be able to find the value um, for exponent uh, that is you know bound to square or cube, um, you can use um, the function mprint from our lang package. is that, uh, you know, in each case, um, these functions have, um, both these functions have a binding um, to exponent. And uh, we know it's a double, but we don't know um, what the value is for um, exponent in each of these cases. Um, so at least what's shown in the chapter one um, is to, is to use um, the function fn or function env um, from rlang. Um, so again, you know, if you extract the function and um, 
look for the binding yeah. so yeah i guess you, you can see that um for both these cases um exponent is bound uh, to bit different values um for square and cube okay mm -hmm. i have a question did anybody test like what uh, happens sorry can everyone hear me okay my internet's been real bad um i didn't test this but what happens if we make okay so we make our function factory power one and then we make square and cube and then we delete power one from our environment what happens then i didn't test it i was just curious if anybody did I'd, no i haven't but uh we could try it anybody want to see i'm curious <laughs> yeah curious too yeah yeah hmm. I, okay let me uh okay let me um get my r up i reckon um, my guess okay, so... would be that you would keep you would the the functions you created would stay but you just wouldn't be able to create new ones my guess. yeah that would be my guess yeah. as well yeah yeah i guess you'd suspect yeah you'd suspect that because it's um it's just binding to the environment the function created not um the factory created not the factory itself yeah yeah um, okay so i've got square and cube if i just rm power one was it yeah Mm -hmm. Try square two. Ooh. Oh, oh, hold on a minute. Where's the? Uh, <laughs> okay. So it's it's. I don't think it's not in my it's not in my global environment anymore. Uh, <laughs> unless it was like it shouldn't have been like that before. Um, okay. Should we try that again? I'm, I'm not convinced that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was just me. <laughs> that's, okay. So that's it still doesn't have no effect. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> okay. So let me put that back in. Okay. Cool. Right. Mm hmm. Oh, was that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, one one concern that's uh, also brought up in this chapter um, is that um, when you're you know when you're um, creating functions uh, using um, using function factories, problems with um, lazy evaluation. Um, that is being that you know R only evaluates arguments when they're needed. Um, so in this example, um, you know we've assigned uh, two to x. Um, and we've created the function uh, square with um, as the um, value for exponent. But if you change um, the value of x um, and then you know and then call square, um, you know you'd expect to get two to the power of two, which is four. Um, but you know you get eight. Um, you know you get two cubes, and yeah, that's simply because um, the value that's been bound to x has changed between you calling the factory function. Um, to create your manufactured function square um, and calling the manufactured function, um, you know, when you need to know the value of X and when R looks it up. Um, so one, one way to get around this, um, and that is um, if you are using function factories um, is to use, um, is to use the force function. Um, so as, as is recommended in the chapter, you know, if your, if your argument um, to the function factory is ends up being used by the manufactured function. Um, you should force its value with force. Um, so you know, regardless of um, you know any change in the global environment, your function will work as as is intended. Yeah. So simply, um, you know, the more robust uh, uh, function factory um, to produce these power functions is just a force expression like that. Um, and then we can see that you get. Um, you get the value expect uh, with square. Okay. Yeah. So this again, this is another section in the. Um, this was sort of the following section in the chapter. 
Um, I guess to me, you know, you say, I, I don't know, the, the term seemed a little, um, you know, elusive to me, but essentially it, it's it's what we've seen with Square and Power in that, um, you know, through each time maintaining state between it, um, which is, you know, the binding, in the case of power one, it's the binding, um, the value bound uh, to exponent. Um, and this happens because um, these manufactured functions have their own constant, you know, enclosing environment. Uh, so, you know, the enclosing when, where the function was defined, which is inside the function factory. Um, and because the function factory um, produces a new environment um, every time it is called, um, you know, each each manufactured function will have its own unique uh, environment. So, so, yeah. So you know, typically, if you were, um, you know, bind, trying to bind a value to a name in the current environment, as you do, you know, everywhere throughout the script, um, you know, you just use um, this uh, less than, greater than, less than zero, <laughs> and uh, and the dash. Um, to bind a value, um, but you can also um, you can also use this. Um, you can also use um, two less than symbols. Yeah, greater than no less than two less than symbols and a dash to rebind an existing name found in the parent environment. It's counter function example here. Um, in the execution environment of the factory, you'd have. Um, zero bound to i um, and inside your um, and your manufactured function um, would update the value i um, that is um, you know the, the value i in in its in the parent environment of uh, of your manufactured function so um, you know for example if you called um, if you called the counter if you created sorry if you created um, two separate counters um, using this function um, counter one, counter two. Um, if you called these functions, um, you know, a different number of times. So here I've just called counter one twice and we can see that, you know, we've kept track of how many times it's been invoked, which is twice. Um, but with counter two, I've only called it once. Um, and, uh, you know, the value for i is. So, yeah. So again, this is, I guess this sort of reiterates the point um, that we've seen previously that these manufactured functions have their own unique enclosing environment. Um, so if you have, if you have different manufactured functions, um, you know, they'll have independent counts, independent counts for these. Um, at least one thing that was mentioned in the, the paper, you know, this is a, at least in the chapter, this is, you know, a fairly this is a fairly, you know, safe example of using, um, you know, rebinding um, of using this super, um, a super assignment sort of symbol. Um, but generally, um, yeah, it's recommendation. Okay. Another thing uh, to bear in mind is that, um, I see, um, yeah, again, you know, manufactured functions, you know, bind the execution environment of the factory. Uh, environment is, um, um, you know, as its environment is bound, um, you know, any objects that are no longer needed, um, you know, won't be picked up um, by garbage collection. And, you know, they'll remain in the environment, um, remain in this execution environment, even if you no longer need them for the factory function, the manufactured function to work, sorry. Um, so in this case, it's recommended to explicitly remove um, or explicitly unbind objects um, that are no longer needed. Um, yeah, so in this example here, um, if you had a function like F1, um, our factored function um, just needs the value assigned, uh, the value assigned to M, um, it's good practice to um, you know, remove remove this intermediate, uh, or to unbind this intermediate object um, explicitly using RM, um, and um, yeah, to just give an example of um, you know the effect this has, um, you can clearly see if you um, if you look at the object size of the first function um, where you don't explicitly remove it, um, you don't explicitly remove um, this temporary object, um, you know. 
the the size the size of this object um you know is is much larger than if you explicitly remove it so you know if your if your factory function is producing an, a large object um you know you should um you should make sure uh, you remove any temporary objects uh, with rm okay okay yeah so i don't know if uh, people have to go through some exercises now uh, for this section um i mean i i will be upfront and say i haven't actually done all the exercises uh, <laughs> in this section yet um but we can go through um some of the and i done which i think sort of clarifies the key points that um the key points that were sort of brought up in this um sub chapter so yeah is everyone happy for me to go through them or yeah yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this uh, first, um, first question is exercise is um, simply asking, you know, why is it better to use um, force X, you know, instead of just, um, uh, instead of just, you know, typing X or, you know, the name of your variable. Um, Cause if you, you can see from the body, the function body of force is um, that all it does, you know, is just call X. So, um i guess you know it's it's not necessary to use force in this case but um it's probably um it's probably better practice to do so because um you know you're just being explicit about um, um about the fact that you want to force the expression um of this um uh you know of this name or, or of this object and especially i guess if you've got um if you've got um a variable that's you know just named a single letter or something um you know if you just um if you lost it you know it might might be seen that you might have just mistyped it um so yeah i mean and just to uh just to clarify that you know these have the same um behavior um i've just written power two where i force um expression and then one where i just uh um just call just call it um <laughs> expression isn't it but isn't it um, to and, do with uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it? Isn't it? Isn't there like a lazy evaluation element of it? Um, where like if your X is uh, a variable as opposed to something which you're writing directly in, it might be unpredictable what's being used if you don't force it. Um. Well, yeah, I, I did think that, but I I tried that here with this example um and you still get the same you get the same value but that's if, um oh. if you use for sex um but that feels contrary to what to what the book says uh is this i wonder if this is one of those things do you remember how okay. last week we had something which was different in um our studio uh, I can't remember what it was. There's a couple things that are different in our studio because our studio makes bindings for things mm -hmm. so that you can use stuff in the environments panel. Mm. And this might be mm -hmm. this might be okay. one of them. Yeah. Oh. Wait, in your. But I, I mean, I guess wait, this wait. is what this is what you're trying to say with. Oh, sorry. Sorry, but in this in these examples, you're putting square two, but I think we want. If you put square x, because obviously square two is squaring the two, yeah, you oh, want to square the x. I, yeah, but this is the... From my memory, because oh, no, I, I read I thought the... I was passing x as x. Okay, you go, go ahead, Andy. Um, From my memory, of reading the help function for force, it does say that force is just syntactic sugar. Yeah. It's the, <laughs> which I thought was funny I mean, too, but it's is, the actual yeah, help, what... help definition is force is just syntactic sugar. Okay. I mean, this is when you call force, this is, it is, this is all it does. Oh no, um, that's sorry, semantic sugar. Force. It just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I, I've got to admit, first time around, it didn't it didn't quite make sense of me until I 
until I tried the exam. But yeah. Hmm. It. Okay. I guess it's just it just looks like that in the in ten point two point three. They're kind of showing that like they get different answers. So I don't know why in the example that they've got it's showing different answers and it looks like almost exactly the same example. Okay. That Wait, am I making? Oh, sorry. Sense? Was that um just part of the the chapter or the the um or an exercise? Yeah, in the chapter itself, on it's like there's a sub okay. in Power One caused by lazy evaluation, and then they kind of do what you've done there. Oh uh, yeah, okay. I think very similar. Yeah. So that I don't understand why that's different. Yeah, because this this was. Uh... So, so in ten point two point three, let's copy this with um, um, x. X is defined. Sorry, my is In 10.2.3, um, when they actually define power one function, power one is not defined at all in inside of the function. So if you change x, I think, is that right? Square C? Oh yeah, now I've confused myself. Never mind. But yeah, well, I was I was going to say my understanding of this was that um, yeah, x is the value you want for your exponent. So um, value of x is when we think x is two, um, you know, we expect it to square. Um, but now we've reassigned um, the value of x. Um, and we call the function and, you know, as far as, um, I mean, as far as square is concerned, um, the value of X is three and not two as we expected. Um, yeah, I don't know if that made any sense. <laughs> oh okay. yeah. Yeah. Because if we did the, like, for example, the environment's funds, we would see the, that it's bound, I think, to just a variable rather than an actual number, because we didn't actually need to use it when we made it. I don't know, maybe I just made things more complicated. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. That was my, that was my understanding of this. Um, Yes, are we happy to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to take um, up time. I just don't. I don't think I understand it. But I think that's. I'll just deal with it on my own. That's all right. <laughs> <at> this stage. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, I think this is no one like any of the stats ones. I scared of immediately. So I haven't looked at this. Um, exercise um exactly but i think it was just um wanted you to look at um the manuals of these functions um and to try and you know understand how they differ um but yeah at least to me there are a couple more examples in this section that i think you know just reiterate the fundamentals of um so oh what's happened there okay yeah so they may be good to go uh, through um, so yeah, here's an example I think so, um, we're asked to create a function called pick um, that takes an index as an argument um, and returns, returns a function of x um, and will subset, um, subset x um, with your value for i. Um, so yeah, at least to, you know, to try and um, map out how I want, you know, wanted this function to be structured. Um, the the index to be, you know, the input to the function factory, um, and then as we saw with this, uh, um, fun the the manufactured function, um, to have a binding to i. Uh, 
um so, you know this is this is what I ended up picking um so you know it's you know fairly straightforward but you know just force the expression force the evaluation of i um the manufacture function takes x um and I subset um x um for the value of i um and yeah yeah, just to just to test this, um, you know, we're given this code to test, um, and this function um, seems to work uh, as expected. So yeah, um, yeah, I thought that was, uh, um, that was a nice example to try and you know nail down the fundamentals. Um, I got another one. Yeah, uh, again, I think anything I I felt like I had to look up. Uh, this is me being lazy at the weekend. Uh, but I was, didn't know what the central moment of the, of the vector was. And uh, um, yeah, I haven't looked at this one either. Um, so sorry about that. Um, but again, here's another example, I think, to try and you know understand how they're working. Um, so yeah, in this question is what happens if you don't use a closure? Um, uh, you know, you don't use the closure to, um, you know, uh, to capture your um, value for uh, um, so, um, you know, this is the example code here where, you know, I is, um, I is assigned a value, um, outside, um, outside of the, um, outside of the function, um, and, you know, this function new counted term will, um, update, uh, the value, um, I mean, the value of the variable I, um, that exists, um, you know, uh, in the in environment, in the parent environment of uh, of your function. Um, so, again, I think this is this um, the problem with lazy evaluation. Again, you know, it will still it will still count the number of um, times you've uh, called the function. Um, but you know, I exists in in the global environment, not inside um, you know the enclosed environment of this function. So, um, you know, you could I could still be modified. Um, called the function and that will you know mess with the counter um so yeah just just to try and understand this if i um you know i call the function twice um you know it returns two um but if i reassign i to reassign i to the value um sorry <laughs> if i reassign i um to zero and i call um new counter two again um you know it just returns one um, so, you know, I've invoked it three times, um, but the value for I no longer reflects this. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, again, I think it's a good example to make sure that you you keep your, you know, at least in the counter case, you keep your, um, your variable, um, you know, enclosed uh, within the function factory. Um, and again, you know, just another good example of where lazy evaluation can um, cause portion trouble. Okay. Again, here's here's another example comparing just the normal assignment operator to the super assignment operator. Um, so in this um, you know in this counter, I is I is assigned um, within the uh, and within um, the execution environment of the function factory, um, which encloses the manufactured function. Um, so here, this um, the manufactured function um, just adds one um, to the value i, um, which is here zero, and then returns i. But because um, every time you call the function, um, you're just updating i within the execution environment of um, the manufactured function, um, and so if you call it again, um, the bar Binding onto R in the enclosing environment, um, you know, remains remains a zero because you've not updated it with this super assignment operator. Um, so you know, you'd expect this to to return. And, you know, if you try this, um, try this, you know, you see this happens. You know, I've called times and just get a value of one every time. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I think that's uh, it. Does uh, does anyone have any questions about uh, these exercises or 
Uh, shall I go? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll take that as a okay. Um, so one, um, one ex of um, that was sort of uh, laid out in this chapter um, was in uh, was you know with GG plot two, um, and particularly um, you know if you use both GG GG plot two. To um, the scales, you know, you you know, show over you know the details of um, you know how your axis scales actually provides um, function factories. Um, so you know, in this case, it may be co comma format. Um, so if you have your you know vector here, the vector the values here. Um, comma format, um, which is you know, or the manufactured comma format. Sorry, if you pass it Y, um, you know your um, your values will be you know form um, um, this other example, um, and yeah, you can pass you can pass something. Yeah, you know, yeah, just a nice way to sort of consi consistently format um, your axes and legend um and one point this becomes particularly useful is that um the ggplot sort of scale functions such as you know scale x continuous and you know its various counterparts or um actually allow you to um provide functions for the label war okay, i'm gonna um our studio but the um the plots came out really funky with the slides so i i didn't but at least you can see here um you know we've created just a plot called call um you know, scale like and margaret and you know there's some other examples here uh i'm just gonna draw for the map actually um just give me one second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. You can see, you know, the values like this. Um, and, you know, here they've been comma formatted. Uh, you know, here, um, ten, you know, 10 to the minus three. Um, and you know and so on um so you know the feature at least that i wasn't too aware of is that you know you can pass um, labels, um they showed that uh, also was you know fairly nice is that with histograms the bin width you can Actually, you can also pass a function um, to define the bin width. Um, try and find uh, your value values for your bin width. Um, you know that say, for example, you use um, uh, different fast facets. You know, you'd be able to um, have different bin widths uh, for the plots. Um, so hopefully, I can draw these up again. Um, just give me one second. So, okay. Yeah. So this is an example where, um, you know, we've just, we've just said the bin width is two. Um, oh no, that's uh, not going too well. Um, but you can sort of see that, you know, the, the distribution is quite, uh, you know, it's, it's not so clear to sort of, you know, compare these uh, across these, um, compare across, um, these different uh, data sets, um, particularly just because the you know the counts in each um, in one just vary so differently to five and fifteen. Um, so what you can do, define a function factory um, that you know tries to give approximately the same number, um, the same number of observations for each bin. Um, so it takes you know your desired number of bins as an input, and it outputs a function. Um, uh, that you know takes a numeric 
Greg back to, to return. Um, so yeah, just here is an example um, of the factory function that they defined for you. Um, and if I just try and generate this quickly, okay, yeah, the that you know the um, the counts for uh, each each data set, um, you know, are much more similar. Um, and you know that these have different bin widths um, for each. So yeah, again, I thought that was a fairly nice example of um, being able to apply function factories. Uh -huh. Yeah, again, they, they showed another example where um, there are actually some base R functions to try and find uh, the optimal bin width um, for a histogram. And again, you could do something similar and uh, um, wrap around um, picking these different um, in a, with a function factory. So you just, um, as your argument to the factory, you'd um, provide type, which would be, you know, one of Sturge's, Scott or FD. Um, and then, um, you know, it would call the function uh, <laughs> um, as needed. Yeah, I'm going to show you that. Um, again, another another application that they um, that was uh, laid out in the chapter um, was sort of buying function factories um, for sort of statistical um, for any sort of statistical um, approaches. Uh, at least some of these, um, you know, they they detailed um, three different examples. Um, but for me, um, I just only dove into um, a bootstrap resampling um, and again I think it has quite a nice um, sort of implementation of function factories so it reinforces these previous concepts so um, I think I'm just going to go through that one for now um, but feel free to you know um, read through those other sections in the chapter okay yeah so yeah you know simply but bootstrapping is just a, a re resampling method where you'd have your data set and um, with replacement and you know, repeat this over and over. Um, so you know, using your simulated samples, you can you know, you have a, you can create you know better estimates about you know your population statistics. So this is an example of, of um, um, that allows you to um, you know bootstrap from a from a data frame um, for a good. column two arguments data frame and uh, the name of the name of the column the name of the column. um so yeah um yeah, you know it just uh, finds the number of rows in your data frame and enforces the evaluation um of the variable um of the variable if you're variable with these evaluation errors and yeah simply you just um create um create a vector um from the, your data frame um and you yeah from this uh from this vector um so you know to give an example here um with the empty cars data set um you're creating a manufactured function that will um, that will look in the, the miles per gallon column of MT cars, and you know every time you call it, um, you'll get um, you'll draw um, a random sample from um, from the MT cars uh, data frame. And yeah, so here's a couple of examples where you know the the input um, sorry the output differs um, each time you call it. Okay. Um, at least one thing that they sort of, uh, uh, mentioned where, you know, this is particularly useful, um, you know, combining this, um, what we saw earlier with, um, uh, you know, with the garbage collection, um, and how, you know, the, the execution environment of battery, you know, is, um, you, you know, uh, temporary objects within the execution environment of your factory, um, uh, aren't aren't removed um, by uh, by garbage collection unless you you know explicitly do so. Um, so here you know you first just um, you know 
calculated addition. Um, and the sort of, um, at least what's said in here is that these linear model ob objects are quite large. Um, so once it's calculated and you no longer need it, um, you can, you know, you can remove, you can, you know, remove this temporary object and um, uh, do your uh, bootstrap um, as before to get your random sample. Um, so yeah, again, this sort of another implementation, you know, possible implementation of um, uh, of function factories. Okay. <laughs> again, it's a bit on the uh, on the statistics section. Um, uh, yeah, I I didn't get around to um, tackling the exercises um, just because I'd you know I I would have needed to try and put in a bit of uh, um, legwork to try and understand um, you know uh, what each uh, you know what each different um, um, so again I'm sorry if you have any questions uh, on these exercises um, but I'll just uh, keep going for now one thing you know tying on from last week. Um, is that you can combine function if you know if you want to you can combine function with functionals. Um, so the example that they provided um, in the sorry the example they provided uh, in the textbook was you know perhaps using these power examples um, you could create um, multiple power functions at once um, by iterating over a name. Um, so you know here. Um, you'd create functions, um, or the created functions would be assigned to the names, um, the names of the lists, um, and you know the values would be used as the value for exponents. So, yeah, in this example, um, use um, per um, per um, to iterate over this list and um, create a list of functions. Um, so, for example, if you wanted to call um, the root function. Um, you know, you'd need to, uh, yeah, you just need to access, um, uh, sorry, list and um, provide the value um, that you want to square root. Um, so yeah, this, you know, gives you, this gives you eight. Um, but obviously here, you know, all your functions are stored um, within this list. And, you know, maybe, maybe it might be quite to have to, um, prefix each function call, um, you know, by, um, by accessing the list. So, if, you know, perhaps if you did, if you did do something like this, um, you wanted to iterate over a list, um, to create functions, um, then one way you can avoid, um, prefixing is, uh, use, um, to use the with function from, from base R, um, which from my understanding, um, with the first, it will create a construct an environment with the um, with the first argument, um, and this is typically you know a list or a data frame. But I think you can provide um, other value. So yeah, here you construct an environment with um, this list of functions, and then you access um, your function. You access your function um, of choice, um, and then yeah, square root of hundred is ten. Um, but one thing for this approach is that you know this environment environment is just temporary, it's created temporarily. Um, so if you wanted, um, if you wanted to be able to access your functions as you normally do, um, just by, you know, just by typing the function, um, you can, you can use, um, you can use attach, um, to, you know, attach it to your, um, um to your global environment. Um, so yeah, this example, it's, um, just master view that were created for the previous examples, but then, you know, you could call your function as you would normally, and then you can detach it later. Um, but obviously this is one thing to be careful with again, functions that are defined within this list. Um, you know, you could modify, you know, they could be, or sorry, the objects assigned to those names you know, could be changed um, in between you attaching and detaching the functions. So, you know, you may end up um, removing an object uh, that you're an object um, that you, you know, didn't intend to remove. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the final, you know, the final, I guess, solution that's you know, provided here is that, you know, you could copy the function to the global environment um, using 
using the uh, rebind function from Arlang. Um, and this is, you know, essentially permanent um, unless you call um, environment unbind. Um, so here, yeah, again, you could sort of have a similar problem you came across with attach and detach, but, um, you know, this is, this is how you would do it. Uh, I wouldn't be able to give you um, an explanation of uh, what these uh, pre exclamation marks are doing, um, but that will come up in a later chapter. Um, so, yeah. Okay. I think, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much everything. There's a, there's a couple more exercises, um, which I guess we can, yeah, we've got time to go through them now if everyone wants to. Um, it's still switched off, I guess. Um, but yeah. Um, so, again, you know, there's this question here. Um, you know, which of the following commands is equivalent to um, calling with, um, uh, yeah, with x and then calling the function f with the value of z? Um, so I guess, yeah, I mean, initially to me, I thought this was a lot simpler, you know, considering the example we had previously, you know, where x was just a list of functions, um, then, you know, we'd, um, we'd get, um, we'd extract the function f from um, this list um and then pass it the value z um but obviously this this actually just depends on you know how x was structured um so so yeah see um in this um the list x um has the function um f that we're interested in um but in this case the value for z is you know defined within the function um, so yeah, again, it's you know not necessarily as straightforward um, as I thought, um, and I think I've missed off the. Um, I could try going through all of the different examples, but I feel like uh, with how easy I get tripped up on words, it, it might not be best. Um, but essentially, it, you know, the of the examples that were provided here, um, it just depends on you know how your how your list is structured. But yeah, I think that's it. Okay, yeah, there's just a couple of dummy slides. Um, so yeah, I guess thanks for listening. I don't know if uh, anyone else has anything to bring up, but. I totally got tricked with this uh, question, I think. Because <laughs> it's, about, oh, it's totally clear, it's uh, C, <laughs> but I didn't really think yeah. about it. Again. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, cool. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, I think that's it for me. Uh, I mean, I mean, it took me a little bit of time to try and understand what they, you know, how they work initially. Um, I guess to me, the, the concept seems pretty cool. I, I'm not sure whether I'd apply it much outside of the examples. That, um, but maybe that's just uh, me not being very imaginative. But I don't know if anyone else um, thought of any you know different implementations of it um i guess I, I was the same i was wondering about the examples of where you might use it i think it did help me kind of understand things of take the account of how the scales were working in gg4 and that was i'd wondered about that before what was going on with that yeah yeah no i i agree with you actually i think that had confused me when i was uh seeing examples and stuff online. So I think that makes more sense to me now, definitely. I think the main thing I'll take away from this chapter, I think, um, but it's, but yeah, I think it, it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool, to, like, I guess type of program you could do or, um, you know, way of generating functions, but, uh, um, but yeah, maybe I'm just not advanced enough to, to actually implement it myself. But yeah, there were some cool examples of it, I thought. <laughs> yeah, I think it, <laughs> I guess it's good to know about this in case you stumble upon the situation where you might need it. At the moment, I also cannot really think of any where I would apply yeah. it. Yeah. Right. So I felt, I think last week with the functionals, I felt like, um, you know, I felt like I could definitely implement a lot, um, quite a few of those sort of straight away. Um, but yeah, yeah, agreed. <laughs>
I, I could see it for the use of the optimized function. I really liked that that part, actually. Because hmm. I've used the optimized wait, wait. function. Okay. So when they explicitly use optimize for the log, uh, log Poisson probability. Uh, okay. Yeah. Because um, it says in the text, you don't need to like do it as a function, but I quite liked it being more explicit because um, I've always found whenever I've used optimize, I didn't really like the way the, the follow through worked. And I liked that that was quite clear. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah. Woo. Yeah, cool. I mean, I, I don't Yay. think I have uh, anything else to say. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, Sam. Thanks. That was lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully through my stumbling, you could uh, pick uh, some things nice up. <laughs> nice, to, nice to meet you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to meet you all as well. Yeah. Thanks for letting me join. Yeah. I see, yeah. <laughs> But yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for listening, everyone. Um, yeah. I guess. Uh, see you next week, it? hopefully. Yeah. You're just on time. High Can five. We... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, let me stop sharing. <laughs> All right. See you next week. Thanks, Sam. Bye, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks Bye. for coming, everyone. See you.